uh, before I start, oh, okay, the session is being recorded, that's fine. Somebody requested that the session be recorded and I cannot do it here because then I cannot send you the recording. So somebody is recording that, that's fine. Um, there has been slight changes in the program uh, in terms of topics and times. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, so what I want to talk about is slightly different from what appears in the program. Some of the topics that I talked about in the program were already uh, covered before and some topics you requested, like ethics, I thought I will add them to today's session. Um, so there has been some changes. There are some other changes I'll inform you about in a minute, as soon as I get this working. Okay, a little bit of advertisement before we start. Friend, P-H, R-I-E-N-D-S, which stands for Philippine, Philippines Researchers in Education Networking Development Service, is a Facebook group that deals with uh, educational issues, advertisements about conferences and publications, and sometimes discussing issues in education. It consists of academics from different universities and postgraduate students. If you are not a member of Friends, try to search for it on your Facebook with this spelling and request uh, a joining and there is a moderator that will admit you and you may uh, find some of the information there useful. I think the last time I looked, we had about 1,600 academic and postgraduate students. So if you're not familiar with it, you would like to participate, uh, feel free to do that. Now, the announcements. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, that's next meeting, I thought we will do something different. And I'm now getting your permission to do that. Rather than have more lectures on Wednesday, I thought we will spend the time looking at new research project ideas and maybe new research teams. Uh, so rather than lectures, we will brainstorm together what people are interested in, what are useful research projects, and who would like to work on them. Uh, so it's more like brainstorming uh, uh, session for throwing in some ideas. The, the intention of that is here we talk about how we do research and what research is useful and so on. But many of you may or may not have research projects. You would like to work on new directions, maybe with new groups of people. So we thought we would spend Wednesday morning doing that. Now, I'm quite happy to go back and talk more if you like. Uh, how does this sound? Does that sound like something may be useful? Anybody's really interested in that? You're too shy to talk to me. You can type in. Dr. Bill, it's, it's fine. It's very good. Uh, there might be stuff okay. that can be you know, endorsed here or recommended by you, by your end. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay. Other people? Other people? Okay. Uh, Hello, Dr. Phil. I, I, I agree. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, if you are not interested, uh, if you already have research projects and you don't want to be involved in new research projects, then you can day, take the day off 
uh, and uh, we will see you on, on Friday. Now, second related uh, uh, announcement is that there will be no consultation Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I need the time off because on Thursday, I have a whole day on action research with school teachers and uh, I need the time to do the final preparations. So there will be no consultation. However, there is vacancy this afternoon for one person uh, for consultation and then uh, Tuesday, uh, I am free for consultation as well. Uh, now, speaking about consultation, uh, this afternoon I have Trini, Vitas, and uh, Jay Ruel. Uh, there is vacancy for one more if you would like uh, to talk to me. And then on Tuesday afternoon, I'm quite happy to have consultations. Uh, now on Friday, just anticipation, I will talk about analysis of qualitative research. Many of you requested that and also issues in supervision of higher degrees. Is that okay? Yes, Dr. Bill. Okay. Now, should I make this uh, full screen or are you happy with it this way? Is that okay? We can see it. Okay, okay. Now, in the first day, we talked about how do we choose research or research areas. Uh, they ref reflect our interest, interest in the research. Uh, 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 we ask, are they doable? Are they useful? How much of the Filipino context do they reflect? Uh, now we want to go beyond that and say, okay, now we have a research area of interest. How do we choose a research project or how do we conceptualize a research project out of that area? Now there's one danger and that's a very significant danger. So please, please, please do not attempt to do that. When we look at one area, and then out of just uh, personal interest or personal preference, we start writing the research, the uh, research questions, the methodology, and so on, without consultation of the literature. Well, you do not get good research doing that. When my PhD students come to me for research project, they nominate one or two areas that they may be interested in. And then I say the next two months, spend it in the library. Read, 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 and read more. Uh, a lot of times the concerns that we have may already be answered in the literature. So all we need to do is to say, well, let's try to implement those and see if they work in the Philippines. Uh, and the literature raises a lot of questions that we have not thought about. There are a lot of research areas that we haven't, uh, well, research questions that we have not thought about, their perspectives we haven't thought about, uh, and then some findings and some limitations that will guide us in our particular project. So choosing one research area is one thing, to narrow it down to a uh, researchable, useful research project is another one. So what we need to do is conceptualize our research so that it is useful, doable, uh, uh, and, and so on. Now, by conceptualization, what I mean in general is writing the proposal. Okay, whether we actually write it to get it approved or not, it is thinking about those aspects that are usually covered in the proposal. And this varies from one institution to another. 
So there are no universal uh, structure of our proposals of conceptualizations. However, however, uh, these usually consist of rationale, some literature review, and that specific research questions, thinking about methods and methodology like type of research and methods of data collection and a little bit about the analysis. So that's how we conceptualize, or that's what I mean by conceptualization of research, uh, identifying these things. What are the issues that have been researched? What am I going to research in, in terms of questions or focus or aims or whatever you want to call it? and then methods in data analysis. Now, in all academic writing, I'll talk about that uh, on Friday, in all academic writing, we do not write to inform. We write to justify and convince. So research writing, academic writing is an argument. Everything that we write, we are arguing for a point of view. When I say convince, that doesn't mean that you're going to convince every single person. That's not how arguments are done. But justify why am I doing what I am doing. We need to justify the research questions. We need to justify the methods. We need to justify everything that we write. And definitely in the analysis, we need to justify. I'll come back to that on Friday as well. That's very important. In writing the proposal, it's not enough to say, these are my research questions. Because the area of research is a government priority. Let's say open learning or flexible learning we say now we in all schools are doing online flexible for my research questions are these this is not enough not enough why did you choose these research questions rather than others like now i'll talk about this in a little bit more detail but these are the four main areas in which we can conceptualize the research. Now, I haven't talked about conceptual framework. That comes later, or part of that process. But I'm talking about conceptualiz conceptualizing the whole research project. Now, my computer is informing me that my internet connection is unstable. If you cannot hear me, uh, just shout. Uh, now, when we talk about rationale, research questions, methods of analysis, and data analysis uh, methods, they appear to be in sequence. This followed by that, followed by this, followed by that, and they should follow logically from each other. But writing them is not linear. Okay, we don't do the conceptualization, sorry, the rationale first, then research question, then met. We don't do it this way. We jump up and down. The important thing is to provide something consistent. So if we had a research question that looks at gender, and we have not discussed gender in the literature review or the rationale, I go back and fix it and then come back to the method. If I want to use a method that will generate different knowledge, different research questions, well, I go and fix them. So I jump up and down. It's not done in a linear um, method. The important thing is everything should be explicit, justified, and consistent okay, with each other. That's the criteria for a good research project. Not whether it's right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. Different researchers conceptualize the project in different ways. The important thing is to make it very explicit why you're doing what you're doing, what that you're doing, and how you're doing it. 
Okay, in the rationale introduction, uh, why are we doing this research? What are the theoretical, practical, or policy uh, problems giving rise to this research? But the most important one, or one of the important things, is what do we know and what do we not know? Gaps. Or why, why is it important? So the rationale should demonstrate the importance of this subject and the, this topic and why we have chosen this particular research question. So these are my warnings, if you like, based on many of the research I have seen, both in this country and Australia and elsewhere as well. There is a tendency of conceptualizing a problem based only on government policy. I have seen this in many attempts. We talk about the low performance of Filipino students and what the education department is doing. And we mention one word in terms of the priority, whether it's early childhood, whether it's... Uh, con uh, whatever it is, and we use that to justify what we're doing. This is a probably a small part of justification but it never is sufficient. And people feel comfortable talking at length at that. Okay, but this is just background that gave us the idea of the whole area. It does not justify one particular research project. We need to look at what do we know, what we don't know from the literature. And then all the factors to be just my research question talks about socioeconomic factors and about uh, gender. Well, why? Why am I asking questions about gender and socioeconomic conditions? They should be based on some literature or philosophical or whatever practical approaches, but we need to justify all the variables. Now, research questions. What exactly is, um, uh, is it that we're trying to find or even try to do? Uh, now, writing research question is not as easy as people think. I can just write two, you know, the standard questions uh, that everybody asks and so on. We need to think about them very carefully. I'm not going to have enough time in this workshop talking about research, writing research questions, but there is a lot of literature on that, how to construct good research questions. And we should be a little bit careful. One common problem that I find is asking research questions in the spirit of quantitative research, not in the spirit of qualitative research. For example, questions that say what factors are involved usually, or, or the effect of this factor on that factor, usually are research questions that quantitative research asks. Uh, qual qualitative research questions, I'm not saying they cannot be used in qualitative research, but usually they are questions uh, formed after quantitative research that does look at factors and relationship of factors together. Qualitative research tend to be a little, uh, questions tend to be a little bit more general. Uh, you know, perceptions of experiences of uh, how to do something, okay, people's reactions to it, they tend to be a little bit more general. And now there are exceptions, but they tend to not be stated as factors, relationships, or relations, effect, and, and so on. Uh, so that they should reflect the type of research that we are doing. Uh, 
The research questions are things that we have in mind when we start the project. In quantitative research, these are the same research questions at the end of the project. The research project in quantitative research is to answer those questions. So it is not common during the process to change the research questions. That is considered a big no-no in quantitative research. In qualitative research, however, that is not the case. Because in qualitative research, we have an idea of what kind of phenomena we want to investigate. But what we actually find out, the important lessons that we find out may not be anticipated before. So in writing the final thesis or final research papers and so on, we choose research questions of that publication based on the knowledge that we generate, not necessarily what we started with. And some people find that very difficult. Uh, like in many of my students, I write, they write the final thesis and I say, well, you didn't have anything to say about this particular research question. Drop it. Drop it. And choose research questions that are consistent with your analysis, with your findings. So there is a bit more flexibility in qualitative research in the research question. And we can change the research questions as we are going. We see one phenomenon we have not thought about. We say, oh, I want to pursue that a little bit more. That becomes a new research question. And I'm doing it halfway through the research. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. If you have any questions, I will allow comments a little bit later. Now, in the literature review, uh, it has to cover all variables, same as the rationale. It will include definitions as well, theoretical definitions, as well as empirical literature. A lot of proposals I have seen that has big engagement in theory. How do we understand things? What do we know about them in general? It's easier to find uh, theoretical literature about the area, but it is equally important to find out research studies about that area, in particular, <coughs> if they are similar to our research questions. What does previous research, not only theory, say about one area. In writing the research literature, both in the proposal and in the final product, we must look at how recent the literature is. Now, if all of your references are 1970s, 1980s, and 1960s, and so on, people will say, well, wait a minute, you know, a lot of things happen. Then. Why are you concentrating on those literature? Uh, now we need to, and, and that's something examiners, referees of publications always look at. How recent is your literature? Uh, how authoritative it is? Where was it published? Now I know all of us are doing research with very limited access to recent databases and so on. So we download things from the internet. Now, some of the things in the internet, I think I might talk about that before, are authoritative. They've been published in refereed journals, but free copies are involved in the internet, and that's good. But there are a lot of things. We don't know where it was published. Maybe it was not refereed, and so on. There are some websites that we may refer to. Now, if we want to publish journal articles with websites as references, it's not going to be considered for good publications. We need to at least the main literature that we used to 
conceptualize what we are doing, it has to be authoritative. If you have a model to understand or how to define something, you have to look at where was this published. It doesn't mean if it wasn't refereed, it's not good. It just means it's not very convincing, okay, uh, to depend, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, use the first instrument you found on the internet as your instrument without showing who developed it, where was it developed, was it widely used, is it valid, reliable, and so on. Uh, now, uh, the review of literature usually happens, or at least starts, before we conduct the problem uh, or the research, but it has to be carried on all the time when we're collecting the data, we should keep an eye on the literature, when we're doing the analysis, when we're uh, reporting, and so on. Uh, now, this may include the conceptual and theoretical framework. I'll talk about them a little bit later. Now, in methodology, I think I mentioned that before, that in Australia, we demand that students describe their paradigm, theory of knowledge, the type of study, whether it is qualitative, experimental, correlational, action research, or whatever it is, and some of the characteristics of that. Why did they choose it? That's an important one. Not this is a phenomenological study or case study or whatever. Why it is the most, you know, why did you choose it for this research? And then the subjects, instruments, and so on. Again, justify justify, justify, justify. Everything needs why, why, why. And then consistency between the rationale, research questions, and the methodology. What many of my students have done, and I think that's very useful, is to have a table in the methodology with the various instruments that you have used. Sorry, well, they could be columns or rows the various instruments that you have used and the research questions. And you can say this instrument is to answer that question. This instrument is to answer this question and that question. So make it very explicit to you as a researcher and to the reader what is the sources of information or how are they going to be used. And to demonstrate that every research question has one, two, or three instruments to uh, answer it. And then methods of analysis. I'm not going to talk very much about methods of analysis. I'll talk about them Friday as they relate to uh, where do as they relate to qualitative. Where do ideas come from? Your own interest, your passion, your knowledge, your preference to theory, theories, and so on. Uh, what is important for your university and policy making. Now, let me explain what I mean by to your school or institution. It is common in Australia that many universities will have some adopted areas of research that defines or characterize that institution. So they would have two, three, four, whatever research focuses. Now this does not mean they don't allow research outside those areas. Okay? But they may have certain areas of strengths that they identify as institutional focus or institutional targets for research. So maybe those will inform some of the research that we do. This is advisors, different faculties, and of course, previous uh, research. That's why it is important to read widely, not all research of the same type. Okay? If you're doing a quantitative research about some variables, read some qualitative research because it may give you not only methodologies and so on, 
but it gives you new insights that you may include in the quantitative part as well. That's why it's important to read widely different perspectives, different assumptions about reality, so that you can make your assumptions more explicit and more defensive. Now, uh, let me stop here for a second. Questions? Comments? Uh, good morning, Dr. Bell. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Mr. Alan Bergara. Uh, you, had said okay. recently, you had said recently that uh, it's not advisable or it is a big no-no to change your research question when you have a quantitative, res uh, quantitative research. Uh, can you give us an insight if ever I will be doing both quanti and quali? What will be my... Well, uh, I think it's legitimate, personally, I think it's legitimate to change questions anywhere, depending anytime in all types of research, depending on the knowledge that you want to convey. I always look at the thesis or research report, not as documentation of what you have done, okay, but to be, be self-consistent in terms of the findings and the conclusion and the research questions. In my mind, I don't think it has any problems. What I'm saying is other people may have a problem. Okay? But in qualitative research is definitely accepted. Because I had projects that had several publications. And each one of those publications had different focus or different aims. So the aims of that I started with in my research project may not be the same as the focus of the different papers that I have written. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying uh, in quantitative research, thou shall not do it, but usually it is frowned upon. Okay? Uh, because they think it may not be scientific. I don't accept that myself, but usually in quantitative research, other people may have a problem. Does that, does that clarify my stand, Ellen? Sir Ellen? Yes, Dr. Bell. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Other questions, comments? Remember, you can use your chat box. Let me check the chat box. Hello, Dr. Bell. Good morning. <clears throat> Uh, there's a, a portion there in your slide about the, back, the background and rationale where you've mentioned there that the government, was that, that more about the government is not that reliable. Could you expound it? Um, I'm trying. The previous. Here. Um, about the rationale. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 uh, oh. beware. Oh. Is this one? Yes, yes, Dr. Bell. I did not say it's not applicable. I said it's not enough. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, so if I say uh, the government, sorry, the Department of Education focuses on contextualization, Okay, and explain a little bit about contextualization and so on and so forth. And then I say, my research questions are this, this, and that. That is not enough. Because if the government policy says contextualization is important, but they didn't say what kind of research is important in that area. You need to justify, why did I choose this particular research project? How did I come up with the research questions? What do I know about them? So what I'm saying is government policy, and some people go at a great length in that, government policy does not justify my research questions. 
may justify why the research is important overall, but not this research. Do you see the difference? Uh, so, when doing research on learning, uh, sorry, alternative learning systems, ALS, we go through the history of the policy and the needs and statistics in, in the Philippines showing the number of people are involved. That's great. That's great. But then we have specific research questions. Why? Why those specific research questions? Where do they come from? Okay. What do we know about it from research? Okay. Now, the common thing is to say, oh, there is no study like this. I have not been able to find a study. I never buy that argument. The fact that there has been no study before, well, shows that, yeah, okay, well, that maybe the research questions are unique. Uh, but there's always some literature on related questions they have to be relevant directly relevant to my research question that justify my research question if you say there's no research in that area maybe you have not looked closely enough so what i'm saying here is not sufficient not that it is not relevant some of it may not be directly relevant for example, if I'm doing the uh, ALA, uh, sorry, uh, studying the uh, alternative learning systems, and I go through the history of the legislation and what each policy says and all that kind of thing, well, it may or may not be relevant to the specific research questions that you have. That people tend to focus on things that may be related but do not directly justify what we are doing or inform what we are doing. That's a very important point. I'm glad you asked that question. Okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Bell. Yeah. Other questions, please. Okay, now conceptual framework. It is part of the conceptualization. Conceptualization is establishing rational research questions, uh, instruments that have to be all very consistent with each other. What we say is important, what we are doing, how we are doing it should match each other. The conceptual framework is part of that process, not sufficient by itself. Now, why do we need a conceptual framework? I took one example here, very simple basic research that many, many of us are familiar with. Suppose I am researching, what is the effect of attitudes on achievement? Oh, sorry, the spelling there. Uh, what is the effect of attitudes on achievement in different uh, in second uh, language teaching. We look at that and say, yeah, it is innocent, it is simple, it is objective, it is researchable. Uh, you give it to two different people and they get different results. You put another person, you say, oh, that's not a useful problem. Or what do you mean by this? What do you mean? So why? Do various opinion, why do various opinions differ and results differ? Well, to start with, there are a lot of assumptions that researchers have when they raise a question like this. Now, I talked about some of them, uh, some of those assumptions that quantitative researchers make the first variables are objective and they have existence on their own and you know there's one way to measure them or if there are two ways three ways of measuring them they all are the same and so on but beyond that beyond that we assume that everybody understands attitude the same way 
that there is no problem understanding what attitudes are. So different people develop different instruments. They think to measure the same thing. Well, if you read the literature, there are many, many theories what attitudes are, and there are many uh, ways to measure it. Are they all the same? A novice researcher who's not very critical would see the word attitude and say, yep, everything is additive. This person said this, and that person explained something else, that person explained something else, and together they tell us everything about attitudes. While a careful, critical researcher would look at those definitions and see why they're similar, why they're different, and then come up with their own definition or accept one of them. So when my students talk about attitudes, motivation, or whatever phenomena they're using, and they say, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that, I say, okay, now you tell the reader, what are you accepting in this project? That's part of the conceptual thing. How you are understanding whatever you are using. Explain it explicitly to the reader. How do you understand that phenomenon? Now, mind you, or, or be aware, be careful, that textbook definitions and dictionary definitions are not useful. Okay? They are general uh, definitions they may or may not be reflected in the particular instrument that you are using. So whatever the textbook is, says, you are using an instrument that has a particular understanding of what attitudes and achievement and, and so on are. And you need to be aware of how what is the basis of that instrument? Or even if you're doing qualitative research as well, what are you looking for? Not textbook definitions, these are not enough, okay? But in particular, in this study, how do you understand attitudes? Why is this important? Well, because people may agree or disagree on the role of attitudes, depending what they consider attitudes. Is it just having fun in the class, or is it a lot of is it measure of time? So, if somebody is quick, is fast, and very bright, and they need just fifteen minutes a day, does that mean they like the subject less? than somebody who spends an hour. Can you see the problems? So how we define attitudes, how we really understand it up to the level of measuring it, the uh, effects, the results that we make. Same thing about achievement, same thing about motivation, same thing about contextualization. Each one of those concepts have so many different interpretations. Now, let me talk about contextualization a little bit more because it, it highlights this problem. Uh, it's a concept that is talked about in Philippines and different contexts because it's valued by the education department and education policy. And I so happen to think it is very important as well. Or what are we talking about? when we talk about contextualization. All of us can refer to specific textbook definitions or definitions in the policy. So I asked people in the education department, my friends there, I said, look, is there a document, is there a policy where that contextualization is fully defined? 
by the education department. And they said, no, this is three, four years after the policy said contextualization is important. Teachers should contextualize, should contextualize teaching and learning. And they said the education department is still working on it. Four years after, everybody was supposed to do contextualization. Now let's set, you know, understand what is what do we mean by it? Now, some people may look at that as negative. You know, there is no definition, deep definition and implications and so on. Now, I don't think it's very difficult. Uh, I'm not sure it is very negative. Because it gives teachers, researchers, academics, everybody, school principals, the chance to think about what interpretation they want to implement. What interpretation of contextualization is most important for them. And then try something and see if it works and, and reflect on it. So <coughs> why not have it very well article allows academics and teachers the freedom to be professionals and make their own judgments. Now I have my own definition and I focus on it in my talk to teachers and, and so on. Uh, now I have written about something similar to contextualization. I have not used the word contextualization. So I talked about something else, but in my mind, it is the same as contextualization. This is very common in, in all academic writing. People use the same word to mean different things or use different words to seem to mean the same thing. So just saying my research is about attitude and achievement doesn't tell me anything. Well, tells me little, tells me little. It doesn't tell me how you are interpreting attitudes and how you're interpreting achievement. Is it low level achievement, high level achievement? Is it you know, knowledge of facts or problem solving? Whatever. So these need to be very explicitly articulated. Otherwise, I really don't know what you're talking about. I can disagree with you, not about the findings, but about your definition. Because if you have this definition of attitude, you may get this result. If you have this definition of attitude, you may get different results. So a lot of times, the conflicting results are conflicting because we use the same language, but mean different things. And that's okay. We cannot avoid that. There will never be a universal understanding of attitude and instruments to measure it. There always be. There. So conceptual framework is explaining what these things are. So we have assumptions about reality that we disagree with. So if you tell me how you define attitudes, I can come and argue with it. I said, I don't like that definition because it assumes this, assumes that, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Okay, I, I, I think I mentioned all of those in different things. Now, conceptual framework is one of those things that probably is the most misunderstood and misused concept in educational research. Uh, now, I'm open to different interpretations, but a lot of times when people are talking about conceptual framework, it is not clear how they understand conceptual framework. It could be misconception, it could be lack of, con I don't know, I don't know. Uh, and I, talking to various people at universities, I don't know that it is defined very well, okay? I have seen research proposal format from different universities, and only one university I have looked at 
it actually is defined what they mean by conceptual framework. The others assume that we know it. And there's a lot of variations in which people use the term conceptual framework. So this one is a research book definition of it. And you might say there may be other definitions, and I say, yes, maybe. There are different definitions of what conceptual framework is. However, if you Google conceptual framework, you will find that definitions similar to this are dominant. So many definitions that you can find in Google correspond to that. Miles and Huberman are very, very well-known researchers. They've written a lot of books about research, and they're widely respected. I'm not saying this is the only definition, maybe there are others. But what they say, very simply, very simply, a conceptual framework explains either graphically or in narrative the main things to be studied, the key factors, concepts, or variables. It explains what you mean by them. And the relationships between them. Simple. It just tells me what do you mean by the variables and how they are related. So back to our example, simple example, effect of attitudes and achievement. The conceptual framework simply says, I have two variables, attitudes, in which I understand this, 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 and that, and I'm going to measure it this way. Achievement, I'm going to understand this, 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 and I'm going to measure it in um, this way. Uh, that's all. That's all. Now, there is a bit of confusion about this because it says graphically or in narrative form. So, in many universities here, they encourage graphically. So students and researchers try to get some really beautiful, complicated diagrams. Now, there's nothing wrong about nice, beautiful, attractive diagrams. But they have to be informative. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. They have to be informative, in particular, telling us how do we understand by them and the relationship between them. In that case, I personally is never satisfied by a diagram by itself. So if I were to rewrite this definition, I would have say, and in narrative form. If you want to use a graphic representation, that is never enough. So what would a diagram be like in this particular example that I gave. Simply, it'll be a circle called attitudes, arrow, another circle, achievement. This determines or effects that. And then, and then I have this paragraph saying exactly how I'm understanding attitudes, how I'm understanding achievement. Then that is my conceptual frame. Obviously, it is based on the literature that I reviewed uh, and so on. I added and the operational way to measure them. How are they measured in this instrument? This is my addition. Now, very simple. It just explained how the variables are used in this word graphically. Um, if you notice, I don't know what your university demands. Uh, I encountered other universities that says diagram, or graphically, whatever, if applicable or if useful. So it's not required. A section called conceptual framework tend to be required in the Philippines, but how you represent a diagram or words doesn't matter. In my preference, both. 
Okay. Uh, now, this is not, and, and this comes from a thesis uh, that I have read. Uh, well, a draft thesis. Uh, I was oh. sure that they change it. It says there they didn't call it procedures. They say this is my conceptual framework. I'm going to do the literature review. I'm going to do the interview. Then I'm going to do the observation. Mm. Then I'm going to do the survey. This has nothing to do with the variables. What are mm. they? How I understand them and the relationship. This is what we may be called procedural, which is good. I mean, it's good diagram, useful to explain the procedures. Okay, but this has nothing to do with how you're understanding attitudes and uh, achievement. This one uh, looks beautiful because it has arrows, it has different colors, it has different shapes. What does it mean? It's not as clear. First of all, we don't do diagrams just to be artistic and creative and so on. The different components should be meaningful. So first of all, there is blue and there is yellow. What's the difference? I don't know. Then there is a rectangle and what do you call that figure? A house upside down. What, what's the difference? And then there's an ellipse. What, what, what does that mean? Then there are two arrows, positive, negative. Uh, what are parents' perceptions? What do we mean by involvement in the school? How is that measured or indicated? Students' performance in school. So, uh, uh, okay. maybe, maybe, uh, okay. Uh, so it's not informative. It has nothing, it only means nothing to define And it's not clear what do we mean by the relationship of the variable. Obviously, there are three variables. Uh, I think, so, Joel, your microphone is uh, again. Uh, so it doesn't explain what those variables, it does not explain the relationship very well at the risk of being creative and colorful and attractive. So be very careful if you want to use a diagram. I suggest for the vast majority of the research that I have seen, the variables are only a handful of variables a diagram is not necessarily informative or necessary, but the discussion is. Okay. Uh, so what does it do? It provides a particular perspective or lens to examine the topic. It's a collection of interrelated concepts and assumptions behind them. It is like theoretical framework. I'll talk about that a little bit but not as elaborated uh, in depth. And there is no right or wrong conceptual framework in the sense of your understanding of the concepts, as long as you make it explicit. So every concept has many definitions. So one cannot say, oh, that's a wrong interpretation of attitudes. No, it just means it's a different interpretation than mine. Uh, are there any questions about that before I go to the conceptual framework? Any questions about conceptual framework? Sir Bill? I'll um, talk a little bit later. Yes. I'm not sure if I understand it right. So mm -hmm. if I write a conceptual framework, um, it, uh, am I right in thinking that it's my way of, or can I think of it this way, 
my conceptual framework is like a representation of my hypothesis about my study. So, um, for example, um, if I understand a particular concept this way and another concept this way, and I felt that this is their relationship, that is just my hypothesis. I'm going to present it in my conceptual framework. But my conceptual framework um, should be, um, since you said earlier that we need to read about um, research, so it means to say that my conceptual framework should be aligned to the theoretical framework. Um, I'm thinking that theoretical framework is something that is somehow established and then out of my readings, then I, I come up with my own conceptual framework. Am I right? Yes, yes, you're, you're right, you're right. I just want to stress the last two words you mentioned, you come up with your own. That's the focus. Uh, so you read and say, oh, this define it this way, this define it this way, this define it that way. In my study, okay, I'm going to follow this person or I'm going to follow this person and a little bit of that person. So you come up with your understanding based on the literature. Let's not use the word theoretical yet because that means a little bit different. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You read and read and read and say, well, my study, I want to use this or this and this and that, and you know, whatever. So you tell it me means, how to understand it and how you're going to measure it. Sir Bill, you, you yes. mentioned that in the conceptual, you mentioned that in the conceptual framework, we're supposed to indicate how things are supposed to be measured. Um, I, yeah, go on. So does that mean that my conceptual framework is also not just like presenting my hypothesis, but also somehow giving the readers an idea of my methodology? Because... Okay. Yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, it is not usual in that section, which is called conceptual framework, it is not usual to talk about instruments. Okay. But be sure, be sure later on when you talk about instruments, they match your conceptual framework. So, although you may not mention it in the same section, but somehow, somewhere, <laughs> you need to be sure the instrument does match your uh, framework. For example, if the instrument measures four things as subdivisions of attitude, okay. then in your conceptual framework, you should say, my understanding of conceptual framework is that it consists of four dimensions. Yeah. So that later on, when you mention the name of the instrument, and you say how they developed it, it is based on similar framework to mine. Okay, so it's like a very broad, not, not very, yeah. but a broad overview of your methodology in a way. Because... Well, not necessarily. Yeah, well, I may or may not mention the methodology. Okay, but in saying my conceptual framework about attitude, I use this reference. Now, this reference may be a reference to an instrument. But I don't necessarily have to say, this is the instrument I will use, and it has seven items, and you know, on each dimension, and it takes 20 minutes to administer. I don't mention all that detail. But I mention the theoretical framework based that this article is based on. That ultimately is my uh, conceptual framework. Because if my conceptual framework is this, and the instrument measures that, well, that's not consistent. So whether I mention the instrument as an instrument and how I use it in the conceptual framework, it's not usually done that way. 
However, I need to define it in such a way that is consistent for what, with what I want to tell the reader later. Okay, thank you, Sir Bill. Sir, Dr. Bill, good morning. I can yes. also, yes. yeah, I, I want to clarify also because yeah. uh, regarding the conceptual framework, some of our studies, uh, we use IPO, the input, the process, and the output model. So is it okay that we use as our conceptual framework the use of IPO model? Well, yes, it, does, it is not consistent with the definition I just gave you because that is a process. That is talking about a process. The definition I gave you, look at variables. So you can have uh, input variables, output variables, okay? But the definition, the exact definition, does not describe the process of the research. Now, having said that, having said that, I'm not saying that's the wrong interpretation of conceptual framework. So what people need to do is to find a theoretical discussion of conceptual framework that matches the input-output process. Does that make uh, sense? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, sir, I think, this is what, yeah. I think it's inconsistent with this. And in my way of thinking, I think it is not. But, but it is widely used, and that doesn't make it right. So what an institution needs to show, say, in my institution, that's how I inter understand conceptual framework. Then everything is okay. So that understanding of conceptual framework will be different from what the literature say. Okay? But if we say it, okay. that's how I understand. If that is what their conceptual framework of a conceptual framework is, then that's okay. But the, the problem is, not many institutions or researchers or programs define what they understand with conceptual framework. They say it should appear here. It doesn't say what it should be about. So what I'm looking at here is definitions from the literature and the definitions similar to that that explain what conceptual framework. If an institution want to have their own, that's okay, that's okay. But this is what the standard, I'm not saying universal, I'm saying standard, commonly used understanding. So from this definition, the input output, the input process output is not exactly conceptual framework. It's a little bit more procedural. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you, Doc. Yeah, thank you, Doc. But I, I want to share, for example, in our yeah. study, which we use the IPO model, uh, anyway, uh, we discuss that, for example, in the process, we have the prior knowledge, and then we discuss eight below the, the diagram that our independent variables, for example, are, and our dependent variables are, so yeah. it will support our IPO model. Yeah. But there, yeah. there was part. a discussion on the different variables. Yeah, yeah that, part, that part is conceptual framework. Okay, defining the, in, the dependent, independent okay. and the relationship between them, that is all conceptual framework. But the, the other thing uh, has the favor, favor of being a little bit more procedural. I did this, I did this, I did that. So that part that you described is okay. Is, is according to this definition. Okay, so I'm not saying 
I said okay. okay, but I didn't mean that. All I'm saying is, is it consistent with this? And and I'm saying okay, Dr. Bill, thank you. Perfect is not. So there's uh, another so question on the chat room. Is that okay? Uh, do you do you want to say more about it? So, so Sir Bill, it's like uh, the the institution has to justify its choice for conceptual framework, the conceptual framework that it adopts. Uh, can you say that again, uh, Ma'am Charity? So what you're saying is the institution has to justify the well, conceptual framework that it... I, uh, yes, I, I would say explain. Yeah. If, if you want to justify, that's fine. Uh, but explain. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, because I've seen this confusion, not only, I hate to admit that, in students' work, but in academic work as well. Okay. So it made me think, I don't know what they understand conceptual framework to mean. So I think it would help if the institution besides demanding a conceptual framework, explaining what to do. Same thing with theoretical framework, same thing with uh, rationale and so on and so forth. I, I've looked at the proposal format from UP. Now, I'm not saying it's best and all that kind of thing. It's quite complicated, but they have the headings and then what people may talk under each heading. So it explains what they expect under each heading rather than just rational aims. Yeah. Okay, so it explains a little bit more. And I think there's a room. Yeah. There's a room for that. Sir Bill, I would like to ask your opinion. I've been teaching um, science research for high schools. And um, uh -huh. we, we usually, you, uh, the, the students usually conduct experimental research, the, the basic experiments. But we don't require the students uh -huh. to provide a conceptual framework. Right, right. So, do you I, think we should, <laughs> we should ask them? Well, uh, in scientific research, maybe there is not as many controversy about the meaning of the factors okay. and how you measure them. Mm -hmm. But to identify the particular factors and the relationships between them, I think it's not a bad practice. Okay. For high school research. Thank you, Sir Bill. Okay. Now, I, I will. Let me deal with the second question uh, from Janelle and then come back and say something about requiring. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. I have read a book before that explicitly says conceptual framework is for quantitative study. My question is conceptual framework cannot be used in qualitative studies. Very good question. Very good question. I don't know. What book is that and how authoritative that book is? I'm sensitive to the uh, concept and reservation about conceptual framework. Uh, I, I tell you what I do with my students. I do not, all institutions in Australia do not explicitly ask for the conceptual framework. There is no section saying conceptual framework. Now, does that mean conceptual frameworks are not important and we don't expect them? No, it doesn't. They are important, but without calling them conceptual framework. 
I had one, I'll tell you how we achieved that in a minute. I have one student came to me and he said, look, I read a book that says we need conceptual framework. I said, well, what do you want to say in the conceptual framework? He said this, 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 and this. But I said, you already said that. So how do we make students express their conceptual framework without calling it uh, a conceptual framework? It is my, many, many lectures also have that habit. In the review of literature, remember what I said earlier, the review of literature should address each factor or variable in the research questions. So when you're discussing attitudes, you say so-and-so said this, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this. Invariably, the last paragraph would say, in this study, I will do this. That's the concept of framework. You look at achieve motivation, you look at any of those variables, intelligence, say so and so said this, and so and so said this, and so and so said this. In my study, I will understand by uh, an intelligence to be this. And I will see it demonstrated by this or that. So, do we have to have? No, we don't have to have, but for the sake of the clarity, somewhere, somewhere you need to discuss. Now, this returns me to uh, Chanel's uh, uh, concern. Is it applicable only for quantitative methods? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, if a study does not have a theoretical framework, and many qualitative research do not have a theoretical uh, framework, discussing a little bit about the meaning of those terms that you will use is useful for the clarity and, and for the communication. As I said, you can have it a separate section or embedded in the research. There is a type of studies, however, which is called grounded research, and I'll come back to them in a minute, where the conceptual framework arises out of the study, not before. So you discuss the uh, uh, conceptual framework in the conclusion. This is one type of studies called grounded uh, research. I'll come back to this for a moment. Uh, explaining your understanding is very important, rather than taking it for assumptions. Whether you call it conceptual framework, whether you put it before, you put it later, whatever, whatever, depends on the study. The important thing is the need to explain the language that you use. You assume everybody understands variables, uh, sorry, uh, achievement, attitudes, intelligence. No, they don't. There are no single universal definition to any of the educational variables. Okay, so when you look at those big international studies, what you don't read is the introduction, the theoretical thing, where they go at length, defining what do they mean by achievement? How did they determine that criteria? How they constructed the instrument? All of those are very important. But what we look at is the results, the numbers, the graphs, the diagrams, and we assume these are not problematic. Of course they are, of course they are. So my answer is I don't know the textbook, I still think explaining how you take concepts is important uh, for the reader, whether you call it conceptual framework or not. So Janelle, do you know how that particular book deal with the need for a conceptual framework in 
qualitative study, do they know the substitute, the conceptual framework that they present? Uh, Dr. Bill, Junil yeah. is located in a place where he said in the chat room it's raining hard, so he might not uh, be able to use his microphone. Thank you, sir. Okay, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Uh, if you want to type, uh, Janelle, your response, how does that book deal with the need to explain? how you understand things in qualitative research if you don't want to call it conceptual framework. So what is the substitute according to that book? That may be, may be helpful. Is that okay? Now let me briefly talk. I'm running out of caffeine, so I need my coffee soon. Let me talk a little bit about uh, theoretical framework. Where does it fit in the study? And then we'll have a break. Okay, theoretical framework is not required framework on all studies. So do not try to come up with a theoretical framework just because you have to. It looks very artificial. And what theoretical framework is not, it is not a review of literature. It is not rationale of the study. It is none of that. A theory is like conceptual framework or concepts, but much more developed, much more advanced, much more complex, much more widely used. Okay, so for example, you may use a Marxist perspective in your study, which means all the categories, even the research questions, your whole understanding of reality reflect Marxist beliefs. Or you may use constructivism. Now, I have to warn you very strongly about this. Thus saying, constructivism is my theoretical framework is not enough. You need to show why. How have you used constructivism? Have you constructed the research questions based on constructivism are the constructs and the language and the concepts of constructivism apparent in all your study? Is your analysis using that theory? So it's not enough to say, look, constructivism is a good theory for all of education, therefore I will, I will use constructivism. Piaget, same thing. He presented a very sophisticated theory. And if I want to base my study on Piaget, then I have to use his construct and his theories and his to, to formulate the research questions, to analyze the data, and so on. And if it is not you know, useful in everywhere in the thesis, then it's not a theoretical framework that is relevant to my thesis. Bourdieu, postmodernism, all of these theories, and there are a lot of research that is based on those theories. So if you want to use the uh, constructs of Bourdieu uh, and his theory to explain things, then that's fine. In the research questions and the analysis, it's fine. Then that becomes your theoretical framework. But if you have none of you, none of these, all you have is some variables, some phenomena you want to study, even in qualitative research, you don't need a, a theoretical framework. But if you do, if you do, then you make it explicit. Okay, now where in the report, does it fall under? Is it inside the literature review? Is it a separate section? Time, grammatically or verbally, I already discussed this. And I think I discussed the uh, first two as well. Now, what I'm gonna show you is not a universal standard. I just looked it up in the internet and I found this book that made sense to me. 
and I use it. It does not mean this is the only place where it fits. But it just appears to me it is similar to what I do, so I use it. But that does not mean it's universal. This, this author suggests this organization of the proposal. The research problem, the paradigm that you used, the aims and objective, then the literature review. Now, mind you, in the uh, research problem, introduction to the research problem, there is a little bit of literature as well. That's not the only place where literature review happens. Then after the literature review, you say, my conceptual framework is this. So it's really a summary of the literature re review as it relates to the concepts that you are using. Now this makes sense to me uh, because my students discuss their conceptual framework within the literature review. So whether it's a separate section or within the literature review, it's okay. I've seen other universities describe the rationale, the research questions, no, even, even, the conceptual framework before the research questions. I don't know, I cannot say this is wrong, but to me, it makes sense. Uh, before I know what the variables are in the research question, to discuss your conceptual framework, to me it appears, I don't know why you're talking about these concepts. I have not seen the research question. So what the, the moral of the story is, where it appeals, should make sense to, to certain people. And whether the university needs to adopt a standard format or leave that to the students is a decision. Uh, but some locations make more sense to me. So in any sequence that you decide, think, does it make sense and why do I put this here rather than there? So there are variations. Now, I said something about uh, grounded research. In this, this author suggests a different organization in some qualitative research. And this is capitalized not by me, but by the author. Some qualitative research, and in particular, the uh, 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 grounded theory, conceptual framework may be meaningful after the analysis, resulting from the analysis. You go back and discuss what those concepts mean after you display your results. Uh, but, okay, thanks, sir. You know. Okay. Uh, last question before we break. Sir Bill, I would like to clarify. So um, you mentioned about theoretical framework, although it's not um, required in any research, but I'm just trying to clarify it in my mind. So am I right in thinking that you can use a theory either as a foundation, as a framework for your study, which in that case, you need to make sure that um, all parts of your study has to be consistent with what the theory, theoretical framework says. Yes, the, other, the other way is, um, you did not mention this, but I, I was thinking you can use it this way, you can use a theory as a way of understanding or interpreting or justifying or explaining 
the findings of your study? Uh, yes. Uh, well, you can use one or more theories. That's correct. Okay. Uh, but if a theory... Uh, okay, if you want to communicate the students, your results and your findings, and all of a sudden you turn to Bourdieu to explain your finding, well, that's going to be a little bit confusing because students or readers may or may not understand Bourdieu. Now, that doesn't mean if you mention Bourdieu or one concept of Bourdieu, you need to be sure that that is your theoretical framework. Uh, it depends on how heavily reliant on the theory to explain your results. If it's just a mention, just mention it. But if all your results are going to be critiqued from Bourdieu, theory, uh, then it probably is better, and the focus is on probably, it is more uh, communicative to have Bourdieu explain as your theoretical framework. Okay. Those so, categories are very central to the analysis. If it's just mentioned, just mention it. Don't explain it. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Now, having said that, having said that, it's a pity that not many research in the Philippines have used more of the contemporary theories. Uh, Bourdieu, postmodernism, and some of the concepts I mentioned uh, in a previous uh, talk. It's a pity that they're not used. Now, I'm not saying every research should be theoretical, but I think it's a pity that not many of those theories are actually used. And that has explanation, it has implications for designing masters and PhD research. We need to be sure somewhere students are exposed to those alternative theories, otherwise, we miss out on a lot of different useful knowledge that they may present. Now, I'm not presenting any of them as the best and the only one to use, but I argued before that variety of theories may allow us to see things that we have not seen before. And if we're not aware of those theories, I think it's a pity. Okay, I'm not going to stop the discussion and the answers. If you have any question, write it down. But I do need my caffeine. Okay, we'll come back in about five minutes. Okay, sir. Uh, sir Jeruel is also having trouble with the connection. Yes. So he requested me to moderate on his behalf. So let's have coffee break. Oh, five minutes, then we'll be back. Thank you, sir. Uh, Okay.
I, uh, I just realized we only have one hour and two important topics. Well, they are important, but also take some time to develop uh, that uh, we, we have to press on, unfortunately. Uh, I would have liked a much lengthy discussion on ethics, but we're running short a little bit about that. And I want to talk about academic writing, which is very important. Talking about academic writing is very difficult because there are no universal rules. Uh, in many ways, academic writing is as individual as you are. But as a novice, I would say, try to follow some rules, not be too creative in breaking those rules. A friend of mine in Australia says, if you want to break a rule, first of all, know the rule, show that you can follow it, and then break it. And I love people like that who break the rules for a purpose. Uh, so it varies a lot from individual authors. It varies a lot about who you are writing to and the content area. There are so many variations. It's difficult to generalize about conceptual about writing, but, but we can share <coughs> experiences and we don't do that enough. We don't talk about academic writing with our students. We assume they know how to do it. We assume that whole process. So academic writing is both a process, how you write, and the final product as well. We don't explain it. We do not. We very rarely talk about how do we write. How, Students have difficulty in writing. Well, how, what helps? What helps? And what form uh, uh, the final product is. Uh, so writing is different from speaking, although speaking can inform writing. And, and let me explain that a little bit more. Students who have difficulty in writing, I ask them, to present a seminar on the topic they want to write about. It happened with one PhD student who is a art major and writing a education thesis. And he was writing as he was painting. Bit of this, bit of here, bit of there, bit of there. It reads beautiful, but it does not communicate as writing. So I said to him, on Monday, next Monday, come to me with 10 minute presentation on this specific topic you're writing about. Present a PowerPoint presentation to me only about that section you are trying to write. So he went home and then Monday came in and made a presentation just to me. I'm the only one in the audience using PowerPoint with bullets and sub bullets and so on. And he explained it exactly very, very well. It was so clear. He was looking at his data. What does this data say about this particular section? And he presented it in a great way, consistent, fluent, and so on. And I was tape recording what he was saying. And I said, okay, here it is, transcribe it. So the way we explain our thoughts to other people is very similar to what we should be writing. Okay, we don't jump from this idea to that idea, that idea, that idea. We are consistent. We connect the words together, not jump from one point to another, to another, to another. We are careful in connection. And it's very, we do that all the time when we're teaching. Okay, not but not when we're writing. We don't uh, make the uh, writing very fluent. Um, now, another reason. Uh, okay, on the on the other hand, on the other hand, when we speak, we use 
figure of speech, we're a little bit sloppy about using words and what we mean and, and so on. And we can use our hands to explain. In writing, we don't. So we need to be very explicit, very exact in academic uh, writing, what we mean by things and so on. Uh, okay, universities don't talk about it very much. Uh, and then it needs practice and practice and practice and then reflection. Uh, and, and comments from critical theory. Now the last point is that using word and technology has changed the way we write and think about writing. I'm also reading, but I'm not gonna talk about reading. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, I started academic writing before word processing became available. So I was one of those that had to write by hand first and then do the um, uh, writing by, uh, uh, by uh, computers. So I'm that old. Yes, probably I'm the only one in the group who did that. But that's besides the point. But, but, when I started using Word, it turned my writing process upside down. In writing by pencil, my pen and paper, we had to write uh, all the, sorry, chapter one first, introductory paragraph, then second paragraph, then third paragraph. We had to be consistent and linear in our writing. When I started writing on the computer, on word processor, it didn't matter where something will fit. I just wrote it and wrote it and wrote. So I just followed the train of thinking. And then I moved things around. This will be, you know, in the introductory chapter. This could be later. This could be here. This could be there. You organize your thinking after you put it down on writing. You come to me and says, look, I'm having a mental block. I don't know where to start. That is the first thing I want to talk about. Don't worry. The first paragraph is probably the last thing you write. That's right. Whatever comes to your mind, put it down. Okay? Uh, and then arrange your thinking into logical order. So it has changed the way we think. Uh, now, in general, academic writing is less passionate, more objective sounding, I'm not saying it's objective, more objective line. We don't use exaggerating. This is the best thing since you know the invention of the computer, or this is wonderful and highly effective. We don't, we try to water down what we write, more as a matter of fact. So all of those superlatives, the best, and we, you know, pattering and all that kind of thing, do not sound very good in, in, uh, in writing. So you can be passionate about an issue, social justice or whatever, but you don't try to exaggerate it. You present to find, uh, sorry, present evidence and all that kind of thing to show that it is important without you actually saying that. It tends to be using formal light language away from idioms and figures of speech. Uh, it has complex grammar and technical words that are important, but do not overdo it. If you try to write very, 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 very long sentences, okay, it sounds artificial and more difficult. For a novice researcher, Short sentences up to the point are much, much better. Do not try to imitate other people's writing. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm not going to talk more about that. Now, write as if 
there are no facts. Don't assume things, but you are claiming something to be right or true. Okay? Uh, explain, justify, rather than just inform. Uh, okay, uh, it presents argument rather than stating facts, simply reporting. Explicit in saying what it wants to say and say and conclude it. To be very explicit, like giving a lecture, you say there are three points under reasons why, you know, students don't like school. First, second, third. So structure. I don't go from one reason and say, moreover, and however, and more, you know, I, I tell the reader what I'm going to write about before, do it, and then conclude it. This goes at the micro level and a, uh, a, a macro level as well in academic writing. Now, this is just sharing my experience in writing, and I'm one of those people who have written a lot. But I still find writing the most difficult thing in my life. It ruins my life. It does not get easy for me, for me. Now, other people can sit down and write and write and write and write and publish millions of articles. Well, exaggeration, but I cannot do that. I agonize, agonize on writing. Now, in the end, <clears throat> when I get the final product, I'm usually well pleased. But the process I find is very difficult. Uh, for some people, it is much easier. So what do I find useful? When I write, I imagine a live audience in front of me. And when I am writing an article, I'm really giving a talk a large group of people who are very intelligent but ignorant of what I'm going to say. So I don't assume they are knowledgeable in my area, but I don't assume they are dumb either. So you need to make a choice. What do you need to explain? What do you take for granted? And if it's a central <coughs> concept, central assumption, you need to explain it. You cannot assume everybody understands it. <clears throat> so I write as if I'm giving a lecture. I find that very useful. You can try it. When I write every sentence, I'm talking to that sentence to an audience. Uh, this is what I talked before, speaking versus writing. There are similarities between them. Uh, I do not follow a linear writing, logical steps. I put the ideas down and then say, how do they relate to each other? How do I connect them? What sentences I need to add to move from this paragraph to that paragraph? Uh, <clears throat> do not be overly complex state ideas as simply as you can, as clearly, as logically, to convince people, not only inform people. Now, I talked about short sentences. At the same token, I would encourage people, and I do try to write long paragraphs, because a paragraph is one idea. And if you move from idea, 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 small, small ideas, it sounds like a machine gun. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. However, if you write long paragraphs, then you are sure the paragraph is well-developed set of ideas or main idea followed by explanation. So if your writing is a lot of short paragraphs, it's jumpy, it is not consistent. It is not academic. And you can see that from 
some of the art some of the articles you see published in good journals and that usually is a good indication of the quality of the writer and the quality of the journal okay so try to integrate paragraphs not just by removing the paragraph break but see how those ideas relate to each other and then make that relationship uh, explicit. And using structured first, second, however, hence, therefore, we need to use them, but we need to use them correctly. A lot of times, however, therefore, are not used in the correct way. When we say, this is the fact, however, this is the fact, it does not mean this is in addition to that. This is true. However, this is also, it, there is a different relationship of ideas when we use however. The two ideas should be relating, and this second idea should be like an exception to the first. Can you see that? Uh, for example, we say, the weather today is good, however, we have a seminar. Well, it's not explicit what the connection here. But if I said, however, sorry, the weather is good, we should be outside, however, we have a seminar, it means that we cannot. So it's qualifying the previous sentence, not just adding information. Uh, the word therefore is very important. The word therefore means this is derived based on that argument. Uh, again, a lot of people use that very wrongly, uh, where the ideas do not actually follow from each other, but, or logically and clearly follow from each other, but just another fact. Uh, integrate idea. Now, when you, if your literature review sounds like so and so said this, so and so said this, so and so said this, so and so said that, that is not a well structured uh, review of literature. Why? Because the first so and so person may have defined the concept then they may find research finding and then something else about that concept another person might also have defined the concept might have contributed something else third person might also have defined the concept find out problems with it and so on so the research literature should not be structured after author, 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 and tell me everything you want about that author, but about themes. So if there are many definitions, I have a section called definitions, and I say what person A, person B, person C said, and then come up with my own definition. And then I can move on to another theme and talk about various authors and so on and so forth. So the structure should be not about authors, but about themes, definitions, problems with, importance of, uh, policy implication, you know. So those themes, so structure, what I say, not the author. Uh, PowerPoint, I talked about it. Now, uh, I think, okay, useful resources about things that I uh, you know, don't have time to talk. I'll talk about plagiarism in a minute. Uh, gender neutral, I mentioned something about it. In Philippines, in everyday life and academic writing, it is still acceptable to use the pronoun he or male uh, uh, gender writing to include all people. Okay, so we say the teacher he, well, we're not referring to male teachers, 
we are referring to all the immigrant spirits. Now, that's okay. In, in this culture, it is acceptable, it is common, it's not a problem. However, if we want to write internationally, that's a big, big no no. Okay? It gives a very bad impression about our writing. A good editor or examiner may point it out and may be corrected, but it leaves a very bad impression. Now, can you, uh, all, many institutions here in the Philippines follow the APA. And one of the guidelines of APA, thou shall not use gender language. So I'm not going to make a comment whether Philippines should change it or not. Up to the researchers here, up to the institution. I know in Australia, no institution will allow any gender writing for thesis or assignment. We have obliged by policy to contact that. Now, whether Philippine wants to go that way or not, it's up to the company. I'm just, and the institutions, I'm just pointing out that internationally, that is not acceptable. Okay, there are many other things that uh, are in place. Now, uh, any question, any sharing of experiences and what you found useful uh, in, in your writing, both as a process and a product? Okay, so uh, anybody would like to answer? Uh, Dr. Bill, sorry for yes. interrupting. Uh, there is a request here from our chairperson that uh, all may tune in their camera, open their camera so that we can take pictures. Uh, while waiting for the response, what was the question again, Dr. Bill? Uh, any experience in writing, either difficulty or something that helps? Uh, would be useful. Okay. If you want to share your experience in writing, what helped, what do you find difficult or problems in other people writing? Yeah. Thank you so much. So everybody may turn in now their cameras, may open your camera and we will take picture. Uh, anybody would like to answer the question? You'd like to share? Uh, is there any experience of difficulty in writing or uh, what you find useful to write? Um, <laughs> Who is that, Mom Cherry? Uh, I'm on charity. I, I, for, in my case, um, I'm. I don't think I'm a very good writer, but. It gives me some sort of confidence if I make an outline first. It just makes me think um, about ideas first and then um, I arrange these ideas in my outline. But when I write, um, I, sometimes find out <laughs> I sometimes find out that um, there are sentences or there are paragraphs that I... I think is better placed in another part of the outline. So I totally agree with what Sir Bill said. Then I think it also helps um, after writing for some time, I do other things so that I forget it. And then I go back to my paper and read it again. So I, I, can, excellent. I can correct, <laughs> I can That's see excellent. my work. This yeah. doesn't sound yeah. nice. So, like uh, sometimes I read something I wrote a year ago. And I say, did I really say that? You know, I, I don't know what I meant by it, or I don't agree with it. So yes, you're right. Distancing yourself for about a week, two weeks, and then rereading it again is very, very useful. Um, it's interesting. I, um, I used to start with the outline first. Now, when I start writing, I sort of have an overall outline. 
outline, but the outline I find develop as I am writing. I wrote a lot of bits and pieces, and then an outline helps me connecting those pieces. So you, you can do both ways. Uh, you can start with an outline and then modify the outline, but so the process is not linear. It's yes, no okay. longer linear. It goes it's, up and down. it's funny because I have so many outlines. Like today, I write an outline and then I start um, working on my paper. Right. And then right. when I read something, oh, I need to revise my outline. So it's like right. a back and right. forth process. Right. And that's useful. Very useful. And in Word, is very easy. You don't have to rewrite. You have to cut, paste, move somewhere else, add, you know, a sentence or to connect it, and that's it. You're done. And, it's great. And I like that it's easy to um, write your bibliography while you're typing. <laughs> ah, very important. I, I don't, and, and it ruins my life. <laughs> yes, it's a good habit to do. Unfortunately, I have not developed that good habit. Now, one comment, people are not turning their camera on for the picture, so please turn your camera and then keep talking to us. In writing research paper, uh, says uh, Rosinia, uh, should the researcher write using personal pronouns? Yeah, very good, very good question. Uh, we, should we say the research aims to do this or I aim to do that? One professor who said we do not use first person, right? It can only be used in experts in research, but not for novice. I, with all your, I hope they are not here. I don't agree at all. I don't agree at all. Uh, when I wrote my PhD, Thou shall not mention I at all. It, it sounded object, subjective, okay? And you wrote everything as the researcher, okay? Now, some people still do that. Very, very rarely in published research, you read a language like this. And I might be wrong, but check some of the most recent publications from respected journals and international journals. It is much, much more common now to refer to yourself as I. Okay? Uh, I, when I read the researcher says this, I say, God, what century are people writing about? This is my personal view. I think we have moved from those times where we want to here to be objective, we have moved away from them. And now it is leg legitimate to say, I did this or this study will do that, but do not refer to yourself as the researcher or the author. It just sounds, I don't know, to me, it, it just rings the bell and I don't like it. But APA says you can either do it we can still be formal, okay? We can still be very formal, but use the I or we, not as me, as research team. Uh, so I don't agree with that comment, uh, but oh, okay, that's okay. Uh, the mess in my room is behind behind the screen. It's right. all right. Yeah. It's all right, Dr. Bill. The frames are lovely. Uh, thank you. In my case, I'm using a uh, plywood. Well, I probably <laughs> need something like that. <laughs> yes. Uh, because somebody commented these are a bit distracting to people. Yes. They so, probably are. But so, my other alternative is uh, my bedroom. And here, I think I've got a little bit more. Mm, it's all right. So, okay. Mom, Mom uh, Nancy is taking the picture all, if now. You, if you can turn the video very quickly and then turn it off for the camera. Yes. And then we can go. Now, I'll tell yes. you something about my academic writing. Thank you. How I proceed. 
new a new idea, uh, like if I have a new idea or a new proposal. Suppose I want to write a proposal about uh, effectiveness, how to increase the effectiveness of online teaching with rural communities. So I get on Google or whatever, or on a database and type on those descriptions and I see hundreds of articles, thousands. Now I don't have time to read all of them. So what I do, I first skim through the titles, the headings, just headings, the whole list of them. And I see a heading may be relevant. So I click on it, it opens another window. I read the abstract. It looks vaguely relevant. I download it and save it in a special folder. So I have a folder and I download papers there. Then I read the second title, third title, fourth title. As if the title looks, might be relevant, I look at the abstract and if it is, I download it. Now when I say relevant, very loosely, very loosely related, okay? So I end up with maybe about 30, 40, 50 articles I have not read, I've just downloaded. Now I say, okay, enough for now. Let me have a look at those papers. So I open every diagram. In my folder, I create two subfolders, or sometimes three. One of them is called yes, one of them is called no, and the third one is called maybe. Right, so now I read the abstracts a little bit more carefully and say, mm, yes, very relevant. I'll put it in the yes folder. So I move it to the yes folder. And then something is completely irrelevant, poorly written, doesn't say anything. I know I'm not going to use it. I move it to the no folder. And if you look at my computer, you can see these. Okay, then if I'm not so sure, the maybe. Right, so now I narrow the 50 articles to maybe about, maybe 20, 15. Now they're a bit more manageable. So now I open Word, Microsoft Word, and I create a file called bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. This is to take notes. So I read an article. Ooh, that's an interesting art, uh, idea. I cut, sorry, I copy, paste it in the bits and pieces. I don't know if I'll use it. I don't know where I'll use it. I just copy and paste. Now I'll talk more about copy and paste later. So we copy it and paste it. And then another idea, another idea, another idea, as, as Ma'am Charity uh, said, I write the name of the author or the name of the file, maybe with a page number, although that's not very important, so that remember later. Now, all of these are not my words. They're bits and pieces of ideas. And I continue reading, continue reading, continue reading to form this really lengthy document of ideas from everywhere. Now, I say, well, that's enough to form an idea about one area. So I'll stop, I look at these bits and pieces and start moving things around, okay? This section is about definition, this section about definition, this section is about definition. Obviously they fit together, so I move them. Then another section could be policy. Okay, policy, 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 policy. So the ideas are integrating while I'm doing the reading. Now, then I start reading reflectively about this. So what are the main points that arise from that? So now I go to if a possible semi-loose outline. And then I start writing my own words, okay? So I use less of the quotations and more of my own words. Now, my own words are still scattered everywhere, but that's okay, I can formulate them 
later. So the idea is that my outline, what I'm going to say, my argument, come while I'm doing the readings. Okay? It may be from the readings, but it could be from my knowledge, my expertise, my interest, and my in, in the social context, and so on. So I never start with my ideas. Not because my ideas are not good. I want to widen my ideas from the literature without letting the literature do what I do. So my writing arises out of that. And then I reduce or delete sections I have used or move them to the end because I may use them again. And now what I'm writing is growing. And then I change the name of the file to first draft. So the first draft comes from bits and pieces. Now, I use this in writing proposals, in writing papers, in everything I do. I always start with a jumble of ideas and then build my ideas from them. Not completely from them. I'm not summarizing what the literature I'm, I'm putting what I think is important as well. But at the same time, as I'm engaging, no, I don't know. I don't know if this is helpful for other people. I don't know who taught me that. Nobody taught me that. I find it useful, and that's how I write all the time. The reason I'm sharing is not, thou shalt do that, and that's the best way to do writing. I don't know. I'm just, that's how I write, sharing. Uh, and I would be very delighted if somebody else shares about how they write. Okay, anybody else would like to share how they write? People here are producing much. They have published. So we'd like to hear from you how you did it. Mom Geraldine. Hello. I feel very bad about having to condense this session, I usually spend about one and one and a half hours in my classes talking about academic writing because there's a lot of opportunities for sharing problems in academic writing, things that we difficult and then sharing uh, experiences more with each other, but I'm conscious of the time yes. and I would like to talk very quickly about that. Ah, okay, uh, so Ma'am Geraldine has something to say, Dr. B. Hello. Ma'am Geraldine. Go on. Uh, um, I'm a product of the old school, so what I do is I take down notes. Okay. I have a logbook for which okay. I take down in to set for reading uh, journal articles and I take down notes. And I made an outline. So, Mom Geraldine is using uh, the log book, then writing the outline. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yes. Mom Geraldine, the uh, sound is uh, cutting the. Yes. I think we got the impression. We got the idea of. Yeah. Writing the log. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mom. Yeah, well, yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, we, I don't know how we develop our habits, but we develop something that works for us. And that's the important thing. Uh, I find copy and paste initially and then moving around quite easy. So that's why I use the computer. But yeah, that's fine. How our mind works uh, is different and that's, that's fine as well. I know a lot of people just sit down and write their ideas first, and then try to fit in the literature. Uh, yeah, if that works, it's okay. Uh, it's what the final product is. Um, 
Okay, can I share also? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Will, can I share, Ma'am yeah. Juliet? Yes, please. Go ahead, Ma'am. Balaay, go ahead. Thank you, Balaay. Uh, me, because I am a science teacher, I actually have a difficulty in writing a, an article or a research paper in sciences because in sciences, we don't need a, a conceptual and theoretical framework. But I have experienced that in the social sciences, uh, it is very important to put the conceptual and theoretical framework. And then when I make a publication, I situate that uh, I have, I, I base so that I'll be do it uh, easier. I, I, I also have an outline and then I, I base on the uh, summary and finding so that I can uh, coincide it with my abstract. So maybe because as we know that uh, making a publication is not too long, maybe it depends on the journal that you are going to make your publication or you are going to submit your article. And then there are some journal that uh, it only needs three or four pages, six pages of beyond 10. So uh, sometimes since we have a very, very long related literature and then uh, it is very important to make a summary of the, the research papers that we are going to, to submit. That is what I had experienced, Dr. B. Uh, and then I want to, uh, I know that you are really a scientist, and I want to clarify because in the new sciences, we don't need a theoretical and conceptual framework. Is that all right, Dr. B? Thank you. Oh, there's no right or wrong, as long as you find a way of of writing uh, what what exactly were you asking about right or wrong uh, in writing a conceptual and uh, uh, theoretical framework because uh, there's sometimes so in, i had an experience that when my uh, students have presented their, for example, their thesis in the colloquium. It is uh, one of the uh, evaluators really suggest that there should be a conceptual and theoretical yeah. framework. So I want well, to clarify yeah. if really yeah. that conceptual yeah, yeah, is very important in writing a research what? paper should or should not be is not universal okay it varies from one institution to another from one uh you know set of practices to another uh, i said you know in australia we don't specifically call for that but it should be implicit in the review of literature so when you say it should include that means he or she likes it to be that's all it means uh it is not a universal requirement in education so a university can insist if they want to have one or not to have one uh and that's the reason there are no universal rules and they can define them any way they want uh, as long as they make it explicit. My concern is when they are required without a clear definition, people get lost and interpret them in any way they can, procedural or whatever. Um, now, you, you mentioned you had difficulty coming from science to mathematics, uh, sorry, from science to education. I came from mathematics to education and few things were big stumbling blocks and some of them help for example in mathematics you don't worry about definitions very much because they're universal and when we come to education those terms 
and the relationships are never very well defined. So I could not follow the arguments logically because there are no proofs in the sense of mathematics. So I found lost what constitute evidence in making statements in education. Uh, and also in mathematics, if you have short arguments, that's enough and considered to be powerful. The shorter, the better. In education, I find I have to elaborate, elaborate, not only just mention findings. I need to explain. And that was very difficult. Worthy. You know? Why do you need a paragraph to say one sentence? Just say it. Okay. Uh, but what helped me coming from mathematics is the structure of the argument and how ideas follow from each other. I brought that from mathematics. So yeah, there were a few things similar, a few things different in the various areas. Uh, okay. Obviously, I'm not going to cover ethics in this lecture. We'll see what we can do later. Okay, uh, sir, you may go ahead with the next slide, the plagiarism, sir. Yeah. Yeah, thank okay. you, sir. Uh, I don't know if the picture has worked. Okay. Now, why is plagiarism important? First of all, it is important because it is very, very widely spread around the world. I hate to say that in the Philippines as well. I don't know if we're very good in detecting it. Okay. My habit is to ask all students and all my subjects to email me their assignments. I do not accept any paper, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, any paper assignment. Now, for two reasons, it's much easier for me to mark it on the internet and write comments. And also it is easy to pick up plagiarism. And every single semester in every institution I worked in, there's about four students, minimum, that either failed or I repeat the assignment, say this is not acceptable. I'm not saying, and it's very important to understand this, it is not a matter of honesty. Okay? Plagiarism is an ethical question, it's a legal question as well, but to simply equate that with dishonesty is wrong, is not understanding it and, and knowing how to deal with it. There are other reasons I will talk about in a minute. So it is a big problem around the world and in the Philippines. That's the first reason. Second reason, it is becoming a legal social problem that has very, very serious implications, not only for the individual, but also for the institution. There are many, many stories around the world. Very, very important people, even presidents of some countries heads of universities, lawyers, doctors. There are a lot of stories of somebody discovered that years and years ago in their thesis, plagiarized, and they're forced to resign or pay fines. So it is a very serious problems uh, that is easier to detect now, more people can read our work, and it leads to very serious possible repercussions, legal repercussions later, but not only to the individual, to the university as well. If the university's name is associated with plagiarism, the university has to jump and explain what their processes are to distance themselves. As far as I know, I don't think any university has been persecuted as such around the world, but the reputation of the university is damaged. And not only the university, the country. 
I heard unofficial references about certain countries that are doing very well in research. Oh, you can never trust any paper from that um, country because they're all plagiarized. So it is very, very important. What makes this more difficult in the context of Philippines as well? What makes it difficult at uh, every, at all levels are maybe two things. One of them is enough time we give for the requirements that we ask students and their level of sophistication. So if we ask write a major paper or two or three major papers in one semester, in one subject, that's not realistic. People do not have time to do that, especially at master's level where most students are. And if we give a task to students to write something, you know, an argument or something in English in that, you know, short period of time. So sometimes unrealistic uh, expectations will cause people to take shortcuts and have to meet the requirements in the short amount of time short resources, then it's easy to cut and paste. The second reason uh, that I think it's a problem here, and, and research supports that, is that uh, people are writing in a language which is not their first language. While they understand and read whatever English very well, expressing them their views in English it to be different from the words of the author is difficult. When I was studying Spanish, I went to South America and studied Spanish, and I became reasonably fluent, like everyday life, I can manage, I can manage to read academic writing. But then I tried to write something, okay, uh, in Spanish. And I wanted to refer to some of the Spanish writers. So I get a idea from person A in Spanish, I can understand it, and now I want to express my view about it. I realize I don't have the language. To be able to express that point of view from an author in my own language, I couldn't. I couldn't. I can repeat what they said. So what I started doing was putting things in inverted commas, and that's good. So if I cannot reword it, I put it in inverted commas. Then another idea from somebody else, I cannot reword it, I put it in inverted commas. So my paper was, com uh, sorry, quotation, 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 quotation. That's not academic writing. Not good academic writing. So it has nothing to do with honesty, integrity, or anything. In this particular case, it was just not being able to do it. So I would imagine many of our students are in that situation. So that does not just justify the practice, but just explain a little bit of what, why people do it, why it is such a big problem. People are giving maybe unreasonable expectations. They cannot do it because of the language. Also the Think that it is easy to cut and paste and all that kind of thing, but that doesn't diminish uh, the problem itself. Uh, definition of it. Uh, these are textbook definitions and textbook definition or sorry, dictionary definitions. They're not very good, they're not adequate, they're not technical enough. They use that language, it is stealing as of something as your own that is not your own to use without crediting the source 
commit literary theft, it's not yeah, stealing. Theft. Uh, and present new and original an idea or product derived from an existing source. Uh, so it's serious, it's a legal, ethical problem. Now, this definition is not very specific enough. What are ideas and, and when are we stealing and when we are not stealing? This comes from an international organization uh, called plagiarism.org. Uh, it has no political standing, but there are people who are experts have written a lot about it, and they define plagiarism in one or more of the following. Turning in somebody else's work as your own. Now, I suspect this happens in Philippines. I could not prove it. Where uh, there are some professional assignment writers. Uh, I think we're all aware of them. Uh, that you nominate, you pay a fee, and they write an original work for you. Even if you use the most sophisticated uh, plagiarism uh, software, it's not going to pick it up. It is genuinely original, but not genuinely used. So, getting somebody else well, putting your name in it, that's ignoble. And hopefully, very few people do that. But copying words or ideas from somebody else's without giving the credit is always also. Uh, uh, um. Now, this makes life a little bit difficult. Now, if I want to write something now, I write it as if it is my idea. But where did my idea come from? I don't know. Sometimes, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I read something that stuck into my mind. Now it's my idea. So sometimes, in principle, that's good. But ideas are difficult to, to trace back the source. Now, if I read something last week to prepare my talk, okay, and I did not attribute it to them, well, then that's plagiarism. Then that's plagiarism. Failing to put a quotation in a quotation mark, uh, given incorrect information about the source of the correct, uh, you know, the quotation, that is something we all do. You know, you, you type in the wrong date or you read something in somebody else's writing. You have not read the original, but you quoted the original. That's considered plagiarism. Uh, now, the next one is very, uh, okay, can't be too many words and ideas. If you have one source and you refer to him, hundred times in your paper, that's considered plagiarism. Even, well, it's, it's really unfair use rules, but here it's considered under plagiarism. So even though if you mention his or her name hundred times, it's still breaking the ethical conduct and academic integrity by overusing one reference. Uh, now, it could be bad quotation, bad words without cutting and pasting from the internet, without the source, or even paraphrasing. This is the most worrying paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is changing some word, the grammar, the tense of that thing, but still using the same structure. We have one paragraph. Okay, you change the words, but keeping the whole structure of the argument the same, that is plagiarism. We have to be very careful. We say plagiarism, to avoid plagiarism, you have to something in your own words. But even if you put it in your own words, but the structure of the argument is copied from somewhere else, that's plagiarism. Inaccurate uh, citation. Uh, okay, so that's for the secondary. 
education, if you like. I already talked about that. Uh, now, this is my course. I have zero tolerance. And I used to, uh, I don't know why I kept it in here. Um, I usually, initially when I started, I started saying, I will return the paper for you to write again. But then I realized with quite a number of papers, I was reading the paper twice. And I thought, well, I cannot keep doing that. It's not fair for me uh, as an academic. So I introduced this zero tolerance policy. But it's not, I don't think it's unfair. Because I explain it. I give this lecture that I'm giving you at the beginning of every course I teach. So that students know exactly what is not allowed and what, uh, if, if they insist on doing it, then I say, sorry, no second chance. Uh, Okay, um, now universities in Australia have uh, established a process that lecturers and students have to go through in cases of plagiarism. I know some other universities have established policies, but when I asked about those policies, nobody could locate them. Okay. So, that policy should be widely disseminated. And all those policies in Australia, the students have the right of appeal. And I think fair enough, they should have the right to the appeal. So with the absence of policies here, or absence of non policies here, my policy to the student is, look, I will say you, but I would be very happy if you appeal to the dean, I will not hold it against you. We know here people worry about the fields a lot, a lot. And I say to the students, look, I will fail you, but I would encourage you to appeal. Right. Uh, I am not going to be able to do the ethics. Uh, very unfortunate. Um, Thursday, I'm gonna look at maybe maybe we can have a choice. I have three topics: uh, supervision, analysis of qualitative data, and ethics. Can you type in which order those three are most important? For you. I don't think I can cover the three appropriately. So there are three topics qualitative research analysis, ethics, and supervision. Which ones of those three are more important? Okay, type it in in the chat box. Uh, now, does your university? have a policy in uh, plagiarism? Can somebody inform me? Uh, we have Dr. Bill. We yeah. have an office. Uh -huh. oh, for our we have an office. Um, regarding intellectual okay. property rights. Okay. And we, before we present our paper, we submit a certificate to be signed by that office to see if there are issues with the paper before we can proceed for our actual, be, uh, before we can be approved okay. in presenting okay. our paper. Okay, and, and every, Assignment goes through that office. Is that what you're saying, or every thesis? Uh, um, when we present our paper and ask for funding from the office ah, yeah. for research, 
Okay, they check whether it's plagiarized. Yes, Dr. B. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, now, one has to be a little bit careful with those programs that detect uh, plagiarism. For, uh, for example, uh, turn it in. One has to be careful. Uh, first of all, they do not pick all plagiarism. We have more trust in them that is warranted. First, they do not pick up all numbers. And the fact is, a lot of people just look at the final score. That is very, very confusing. Okay, so if you a, a, a quote a large section from one source, you get low score because that's one incident of plagiarism. Uh, so we have to be careful what that low score means and where. So what we need to do is look at the incidences of plagiarism in detail, not only the final score. Uh, but okay, so you have something in that. Are students directly aware of the policy? What will happen if they were caught cheating? What mechanisms they have? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think that's important. Students knowing exact, because when I give this lecture to people, people are really surprised about what constitutes plagiarism especially that paraphrasing. They don't think about it as plagiarism, but it is. Uh, so, Mr. Anyway. Bill, uh, are we going to have, uh, shall we push through with the Wednesday activity, having the, because only four signified, Ma'am Tamano, Sir Medina, Sir Siketi, and Dr. Dinoro? To have consultation with you on Wednesday? Uh, no, Wednesday is not consultation. I uh, a it's a workshop. Workshop to on... generate new yes. ideas. So oh, as okay. many, I, I'm kind of happy to cancel it, but let me explain. My yes, idea sir. is to get people together to start by what are the big issues in education and all of that. Okay, what sir. might you be interested in, and argue with each other and then maybe group those into new proposals. Now, if there is no interest in something like that, I'm very happy to drop it. Yes, so correct. we would like to hear from the rest of Somebody said the yes, participants. The workshop, workshop. Yes, it seems there are Okay, I, I would like to hear from others, yes to the workshop, no to the workshop. Yes to the workshop. Okay, okay. type it in, type it in, so that we are yeah. a little bit uh, evidence-based. Type it in. Uh, yes uh, Dr. Bill, yeah, Dr. Bill, I want to suggest that uh, there will be a grouping first so that we can talk what kind of research that we are going to propose. So we have to group first now, and well, then... No, no, yeah, I think so. that, that will come up from the workshop, because I want to ask a series of questions before what we said. Ah, okay, okay, do Generate those research questions rather than ask people mm -hmm. what you already think. Okay, so yes to the workshop, Dr. Bill. Okay, I'm sorry. No, if you don't want, if you don't need the workshop, you don't want to join, that's fine, I understand. But I think, I think it's a good idea. I discussed it with the uh, organizing uh, committee of the program. They thought it was a good idea. And now I'm asking your opinion as well. I, I think it's, but I don't want to impose it on people. Okay, so we will have the workshop. Okay, that's okay. No need to commit yourself to join a team. Uh, okay, so 
I will review this in terms of the content for Friday and give priority to these three areas. I hope I, I'm happy to go to one o'clock on Friday if need be and discuss the three issues because I think all of them. Or on the other hand, I can delay the talk about analysis of qualitative research for a later date at the outset. Okay, I, I shall do that. So please express your opinion about workshop or no. Well, workshop, we decided to do it, but express your opinion about the three, the importance of the three areas, analysis of qualitative research, uh, ethics, uh, and supervision. I think discussion on supervision is very important as well, but if we cannot do all three well, which one do you like? Okay, so Sir B Dr. Bill from the chat room, uh, many majority analysis, supervision, ah, analysis, ethics, supervision. Okay. That's the right thing. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, that, that is helpful. Uh, I think I will cover all three, but giving more focus on the analysis and the ethics. Yeah, great. I like this group. You're very good in making decisions. Yeah, <laughs> thank you all. Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, so uh, we will have consultation at one o'clock. I have only three people uh, uh, who requested that I will see them at one o'clock or start seeing them at one o'clock. And the rest of you, I will see you hopefully on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Good it's such a heavy but a very enjoyable one, the Lovely. morning session. Thank you so much. So Thank God you. bless us all. My Let's pleasure. take our lunch now. See you on Wednesday. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay.